Welcome everyone to our inaugural gathering of our Harvard Extension School Author Spotlight Series. My name is Jill Felicio and I am a member of Harvard Extension School's classes of 2000 and 2013, as well as the Director of Advancement here at Harvard's Division of Continuing Education. Now I am delighted to welcome all of you who are tuning in from over a dozen time zones and our special guest, Professor Tom Nichols, who will share his insights into his latest book, Our Own Worst Enemy, The Assault from Within on Modern Democracy. Now, as we get underway, I just want to share a couple of housekeeping notes. Please use the Q&A box to say hello from wherever you are in the world, or to ask a question, please use our Q&A box. Tom will address them toward the end of the program. And today's video will be available on Harvard Extension School's YouTube channels just as soon as it is fully captioned. Now, Tom Nichols is a professor of national security affairs at the United States Naval War College, soon to be retiring, where he was previously the secretary of the Navy fellow, the Forrest Sherman chair of public diplomacy and a chairman of the strategy department. He is also a senior associate at the Counter Count Carnegie Council on Ethics and International Affairs in New York City and a fellow of the International History Institute at Boston University. Now in 2012, he received the Petra Shattuck Excellence in Teaching Award from Harvard Extension School. He also has taught at Dartmouth College and Georgetown. He, uh, Tom received his BA from Boston University, a master's from Columbia and holds a PhD from Georgetown. Now, Tom teaches two very beloved Harvard Extension School courses that many of you may have taken or are taking. His fall class, Nuclear Weapons and International Security, and his spring class, Popular Culture and U.S. Foreign Policy During the Cold War, has educated thousands of um, Harvard Extension School alumni and participants. Now, with that, it is my honor to welcome Tom to share any and all insights on the writing of this remarkable book. Tom. Thanks, Joe. And um, it's wonderful uh, to be um, uh, back with you all uh, and, uh, and here with Extension. And as always, um, this is one of uh, three books that I've actually written uh, with, actually four books, with the help of uh, students from Harvard Extension. So it's, uh, it's especially nice to be here. Um, what I thought I would do is I have some slides. I'll kind of lay out the book, why I wrote it, what the book is about, and then move to what I think will be the um, more engaging part, because I, I think in the middle of the day, having me just talk at you is a little much, um, uh, to the Q&A, and then we'll have a discussion. So with that, let me uh, start here by sharing this. <clears throat> there we go. Sorry, everybody. Uh, there. <laughs> there we go. That should do it. Everybody seeing that? There we go. So the book, um, I actually I wrestled even with the title of the book. This was a really hard book to write because in part there's a lot of autobiographical detail in it. Um and it was a difficult book to write because I didn't even know what to call it. I, I, I mean, you, it's a hard thing to turn to your fellow citizens and to say, you know, we have a lot of problems with our democracy um, and you're the problem. Um, but the fact is, democracy is in trouble, not just in the United States, but around the world. There are illiberal movements um, of varying degrees of success in the United States, Britain, Poland, Italy, Brazil, Turkey, India, Hungary, and many other places. And by illiberal, what I mean is that citizens in these democracies are rejecting the foundations of a liberal democracy, of a small l liberal democracy. That is the, the things, the beliefs, the norms that make a democracy work. Tolerance, cooperation, equality, the rule of law, secular government. These are being attacked by populists of both the right and the left, although is particularly in the United States, the, the hardening authoritarian movement is really coalescing on the right as it is uh, in places like Turkey and Hungary. Um, this populism is constantly making an appeal to the public to, to uh, put the people, and it's always the people, almost in capital letters, against the elites. 
no one ever really defines this, but um, what these leaders and their movements mean is that whoever's in our tribe are the people and everybody else isn't the people. It's a very divisive, uh, very um, 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 uh, it's almost a, a movement that dehumanizes people on the other side of any political belief. Um, and it's meant to. And that is typical of populist movements, even the most um, benign populist movements, the ones that are, you know, America in the 19th century, um, some of the populist movements that have occurred in other places, still nonetheless fairly divisive to say that, you know, we speak for the real people rather than um, the elites, who, whoever they might be. Now, interestingly, um, previous explanations about why this is happening just don't make sense. Over the past five years, especially in the United States, but even uh, over the past 10 to 15 years since the mid 90s, uh, there have been a lot of explanations that, that suggest that people are losing their faith in democracy because of economic deprivation or because of globalization, or because young people are disenfranchised. The, the problem is these are all great theories, but the, the data just doesn't back them up. Um, the, the most uh, implacable enemies of democracy in the United States and around the world are actually in the new middle class. Um, and it's mostly about a sense of respect and cultural resentment rather than it is about money or living standards. And so when I wrote this book, I, I tried very hard to take those alternative explanations seriously, and I just couldn't get to a point where I could make them work. And yet they are, until recently, these were the conventional wisdom. I, I suppose um, I, I'm sort of grimly pleased that the explanations in our own worst enemy now are becoming the conventional wisdom. There was a piece about two weeks ago in the Washington Post uh, that got a lot of attention where um, Robert Kagan said, hey, maybe this isn't about economics. Maybe this is about culture and resentment and the internet and, you know, um, boredom and all the other things that I wrote about. And um, in my best John McClain voice from Die Hard, I wanted to yell, welcome to the party, pal. Uh, because I think that even two years ago, those explanations had a lot more force. And I think the events of the past two, three years have really kind of blown those out of the water. So, so why is this happening? Well, paradoxically, and I know these are counterintuitive, the, I looked at the fact that we are successful beyond our expectations. Um, we live in a time of peace and prosperity. And I, I know that people bristle at this. They say, but wait, you know, Afghanistan and Iraq and all the trouble in the world, you know, Barack Obama, a few years back, <clears throat> toward the end of his presidency, said, we live in the most peaceful and prosperous time in American in world history. He said it to a European audience. And he was roundly castigated by the usual folks at Fox and other places. But on the facts, President Obama was right. Um, compared to even when I was a boy, say, within my lifetime, um, I was born in 1960. If you look at a period like 1970, uh, you know, the world was being convulsed by gigantic conflicts, and we don't even remember them anymore. The Biafran Civil War, a million dead, Bangladesh, um, the various border skirmishes around the world, an almost nuclear war between Russia and China in 1969. Uh, the fact of the matter is, the end of the Cold War let us, let us, particularly in the West, start taking the world a little less seriously. Um, there was a kind of a guardrail on our politics for years that said, well, you know, you, you have to take politics at least a little bit seriously because, you know, the president's going to have his finger on the button. Uh, we have to deal with this opposing regime that means to means us ill. Um, and we were, you know, we had to, we, we didn't think about it every day, but we had to consider it. Um, and we had to live under that note, that knowledge. Once that was over, uh, and I, I, I don't usually get along with Andy Basevich about politics, um, but Andy was right when he said this, in a way, the end of the Cold War was like winning the lottery. Uh, and, you know, lottery winners generally don't do well. 
when they hit the lottery. We also have had an unbroken stretch for a good 40 years here of prosperity. And again, I know people bristle at this. They say, but you know, the Great Recession, the housing crash. Um, the reality is um, we are living in better times even then again within my own lifetime. Um, you know, when I tell extension students, I mean, I've had this discussion in class. And I say, look, you know, the, the late 1970s were hideous. I mean, they were, you know, 10% unemployment. And kids kind of look at me and say, that's not possible. And I'm like, no, it's, it's, it's possible. It's, it's real. It happened. Um, we have gotten used to very high levels of affluence. And this has produced, in a technologically advanced society, high levels of boredom. Um, in the book, I, I give a shout out back about 70 years to the writer Eric Hoffer, who sent us a warning that we have since forgotten over the decades that the most dangerous and fertile soil for a mass authoritarian movement is actually among a bored middle class. It's not among the very poor, it's not among the very rich. It's when there's a lot of people um, who are basically bored and looking for meaning and are comfortable enough and have the time to invest in, um, in illiberal um, protests and activities. Uh, this has been aided by technology and our high living standards. There is a thing called hedonic adaptation. I love that phrase, where you get used to things being the, um, you know, the most, um, it's like if you've been sleeping in a king bed, you think a standard size bed is tiny. You think it's a bunk bed. Um, if you're used to eating steak, you think hamburger tastes like shoe leather. Um, we've just gotten used to an extremely high level of stand living standards. And part of that, and we can talk about this more in a bit, um, is the problem of hyperconnectedness. We spend way too much time connected to each other, but anonymously and at a distance. We spend all of our time um, snooping on each other, looking into each other's homes, uh, measuring the value of each other's homes. Um, pouring through our vacation photos, living vicariously through each other on social media. Um, it has, I, I am a technological optimist. I love the internet. Um, I love social media because I am there a lot. I think it's been a force for peace in the world, but now it's tearing us apart because we now have the affluence, the peace, the prosperity to sit around and engage in the narcissism of small differences with our, with our friends and neighbors, and to basically figure out how to get attention in this new economy based on cultural influence and attention by basically being mean to each other. This has led to a complete collapse of civic virtue, I think, in the United States and in other places. We now, we now seek to be entertained constantly. 1985, uh, Neil Postman wrote a great book called Amusing Ourselves to Death, and that's pretty much what we're doing now. Um, we live in an age of populist entertainers and celebrities who use politics as vehicles for themselves. Uh, this was pioneered years ago by the odious Silvio Berlusconi in Italy. Um, in America, Trump has been the worst and most obvious example, but there are others that I talk about in the book. <clears throat> Boris Johnson, uh, you see here, parachuting his way in uh, and making a big deal about Brexit. Um, as my Atlantic colleague, um, Ann Applebaum, pointed out privately, even at the same time, Johnson was sneering at Brexit. He was laughing about it. Um, and yet, when that became the, the vehicle for Johnson's ascent to power, suddenly he was jumping off of buildings with British flags. Uh, these populists around the world are usually plutocrats. I mean, what's really amazing is that supposedly these that these supposedly populist movements are almost inevitably either led by or funded by remarkably wealthy people. Whether it's the Five Star Movement in Italy, um, Trump and the Republicans in the United States, the Brexiteers. Uh, <clears throat> these are um, you know Orban in Hungary. These are almost. In, exclusively movements led by extremely wealthy people who then uh, go from exploiting economic woes because they don't want to spend a lot of time talking about economic inequality uh, to firing up culture wars. And so you have Donald Trump, who um, for years, decades, was a Democrat because he lived in New York and in uh, 
in the first of Bob Woodward's books about him, there's a great scene where his advisor, Steve Bannon, goes to him and says, well, you know, you want to run for president, but you're, you're pro, you want to be a Republican, but you're pro-choice. And Trump shrugs and he goes, okay, fine. I'm not pro-choice anymore, pro-life. Um, he says, but you've given all these money to Democrats. And he says, okay, fine. I'll give a lot of money to Republicans. Um, this is incredibly cynical. Um, it is meant to mobilize people based on their worst instincts. And it is meant to speak to an audience of a bored, angry middle class that is basically searching for some meaning in their lives. Um, and this constant sense of conflict provides that kind of meaning. Now, why are people so um, prone to this? Well, the underlying problem here and the driver of this civic collapse for, for a good 40 years or so has been the growth of narcissism, which has produced a culture of entitlement and resentment in the developed world. Um, this is not an opinion. Um, social psychologists have tracked this empirically in the United States and in other countries. There is, it is literally not arguable that we are a more, by any measure, a more narcissistic culture. Um, and narcissism is the enemy of community. You cannot, by definition, a narcissist does not care about things like civic virtue or community. Um, and we spend a lot of time comparing ourselves, measuring ourselves, uh, competing with each other, um, but also angrily seeking um, applause and approval from each other. Now, some of this is being driven by demographic change. Um, there is an aging white population that feels very aggrieved. Um, they feel that they are the true citizens of the country, that they built America and it's all being taken away from them. Um, this kind of narcissistic cultural uh, conflict is being put on steroids because of social media and cable news. Uh, television in particular is increasing our anxiety because it, it focuses on terrible news. Um, everything happens immediately in real time and it happens to you. I was thinking about this, watching um, a story one day about a truck overturning in Ontario. And it just was like live coverage for like 15 minutes on cable. And I'm like, it's a truck in Ontario. This is a local story in Canada. And I'm sitting here in Rhode Island saying, gee, I wonder if everybody's okay. Um, the other thing that this does, that this negativity and constant sense of panic and anxiety does, is it breeds um, a narcissistic sense of heroism that you know, you, only you can solve these problems. You are immediately involved in these things. You, think of, and I, when I wrote the book, The Death of Expertise, I hammered on the same thing. Um, think of, you know, that at five o'clock, Wolf Blitzer says, you are in the situation room. No, you are not. The president's not even in the situation room most of the time. Um, but it's, it's the sense of immediacy and that only you can solve this. And when, when the internet and television bring us closer together, it brings clashing culture into closer proximity, and it leads people to think that they must become the heroic defenders of their particular tribe. And this goes from right to left across the spectrum, that um, we all see ourselves now as superheroes. You know, it's not an accident, and I don't want to make too much of this, but it is not incidental that the most popular form of entertainment in America for the past 20 years, the largest selling movies and some of the most successful TV franchises are all about superheroes. Um, we have become a permanently adolescent culture. And adolescents, as those of us who are parents know, are narcissistic and um, grandiose and think of themselves as um, tragic heroes uh, constantly fighting a world that doesn't understand them. That pretty much sums up the American voter as well as voters in a lot of other countries. And in part, it is because we spend far too much time staring at ourselves through electronic media. Uh, add to this the fact that reality doesn't mean very much anymore. I wrote about this in my previous book, The Death of Expertise. The implosion of knowledge in a narcissistic culture where uh, no matter what you say to someone who thinks that you know the election was stolen or that there are microchips in the vaccine or you know, other crazy things. They say, well, I've done my own research. 
Um, I know things. I'm smart. Um, you cannot, you literally cannot argue with that kind of mindset, nor can you sustain a democracy on that kind of narcissistic, me first um, sense of nostalgia and grievance. No government can keep up with that. It's not possible. No government can possibly satisfy that level of, of anger and entitlement. And that's part of the reason we're in the crisis we're in. So how does it end? Well, um, I think it ends mostly with a whimper rather than a bang. Um, for all of our fear of mobs storming the Capitol, um, I think mostly it ends with our own laziness. In the end of the book, I, I suggest a few scenarios. Um, one of them is the 1984 scenario, but without the violence and without the, the party. Um, I was, <clears throat> when I was writing the book a few winters ago, it seems like forever ago during the pandemic, and I was on a treadmill and I decided to revisit some of the classics and I was listening to 1984 and I was struck and I put it into the book of um, George Orwell's description of the proles. Not, not the people that are oppressed by the party, not the kind of middle-class technocratic um, folks, but rather the people that the party ignores, where you have a very small number of people in charge of the world, and then millions and millions of people who only care about um, beer and gambling and football and um, sort of, you know, their petty squabbles with each other. And as the party in 1984 says, proles and animals are free. These are the proletariat and the and animals. Um, the, the central party has no interest in them, uh, not because they are above suspicion, but because they are beneath suspicion. And I worry about that. I worry about a world where we have um, millions of people who are not oppressed, but simply are allowed to live their lives, um, you know, by hanging around in casinos and having 150 sports channels um, and who couldn't care less about how their country is governed because they are um, kept basically happy um, with petty amusements. I worry that that's where we are right now. That I didn't talk a lot about Brave New World, the world where we, um, Aldous Huxley's world, where we kind of indulge ourselves with sex and drugs and vibrating chairs and um, silly vacations, because I think that's kind of where we've been for about 20 or 30 years. The question is, what comes next? And I worry that what comes next is the disenfranchise of huge numbers of people who simply don't care as long as they have um, cheap calories and um, 300 television stations. The, um, I think the more likely scenario and the one that I worry about even more is the technocracy scenario, which I lifted. Uh, I, I'm a child of the 70s and the 80s, so I had to lift a scene from the classic 70s movie, Three Days of the Condor, where uh, a sort of, you know, faceless CIA bureaucrat says, you know, in the end, when things get tough, people aren't going to want us to ask them for things. They're going to want us to just get it for them. And I worry that we're heading toward that, that millions of people kind of comfortably middle class say, look, um, don't bother me. Just make sure that the Wi-Fi is always on. Um, you know, make sure that I can go to Disney once a year. Make sure that I'm, you know, live a pretty comfortable life. And that's democracy. Like that's as much democracy as I need or care about. I think you're seeing that in places like Hungary and Poland and Turkey and other places saying, you know, um, just be a strong man who gets things for me and punishes people I don't like uh, and keeps other people away from me, and that's fine. And I, I worry that that's where we're headed. I tried to be a little more optimistic um, to, to remind people of the greatness of democracy as expressed through Pericles in the classic Peloponnesian War. But unfortunately, I have to remind all of you that Pericles, the Peloponnesian War goes on for 27 years. Athens falls to an enemy power democracy is dismantled. And Pericles doesn't live to see any of it because two years into the war, he dies from a plague, which I thought was somewhat um, foreshadowing. So what do we do? Is there a way out? How do we restore civic virtue? 
uh, I think the first thing we have to do is stop believing that we can all be constitutional architects and that every time we vote, um, we have to redesign the constitution. Civic virtue gets restored by being an example to our fellow citizens, by one conversation at a time, one project at a time that we can work on in some bipartisan way. It, it infuriates me to no end um, that even people that I agree with, um, you know, I consider myself part of the pro-democracy coalition now. And yet, you know, when I say things like, well, yeah, we should do something about voter suppression, we should do something about um, gerrymandering, we should do something about, you know, participation. And they say, yeah, well, when I vote for president, and I'm like, when's the last time you voted in a local election? Oh, I don't vote in those. Those are boring. I don't care about those. We have turnouts in, in Democratic primaries, in places like Seattle and New York, where the turnout is literally 12 to, to 14%. Um, and then we wonder why turnout later is low, because people are not in the habit of voting. Um, so one project at a time, a little bit more self-discipline if we can find it, uh, to have those conversations. And I, I'll, I'll end on this. I don't think we should spend our time having conversations trying to persuade people who have decided democracy doesn't work or that um, you know they shouldn't have to do their uh, fair share um, you know, with wearing a mask in a store or something. Um, you can't really argue with people who are that narcissistic and wrapped up in themselves. What you can say is, I am not going to have this conversation with you. These are the things I believe. If you believe in those two, you know, we can talk, but I am not, I am not here to be a sounding board for your uh, grievances. And I think that that's actually an important thing. The conversations we have with each other have to include the conversations we won't have with each other. Um, I, those of you that read The Death of Expertise know that the, one of the phrases I hate more than anything is, let's agree to disagree. Nor, almost inevitably, when someone says that to me, I say, no, I'm going to agree to keep disagreeing um, because sometimes disagreement is principle and that's important. Um, but if we can't do this, if we can't somehow restore some sense of civic cooperation uh, to, um, to our life here in the United States or around the world, um, we will, as, you know, the, as Hemingway said about our... Um, Fitzgerald said about going broke, you, you do it gradually and then suddenly. And I worry that um, we're closer to that than, than we want to believe. So let me stop there and um, be happy to take your questions. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, getting back to your three modest proposals that you include at the end of the book, you talk about uh, political parties as having once meant something. And you know, you end that on a positive sentiment that these parties can uh, mean something once again in the future. And we have a great question uh, from a gentleman named Bill Hauser who um, asked very specifically about the Lincoln Project and the myriad of initiatives that are basically partyless. So I wonder if you could spend a few moments talking about um, as a path that you can see for parties to become meaningful again, and what is the impact of these partyless initiatives? Well, <clears throat> I think um, it, the, the proposal we're talking about at the end of the book is when I said parties actually need to be stronger. It should mean something to be a Democrat or it should mean something to be a Republican. And the two examples I used were, were Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. I mean, Donald Trump was basically hijacked the Republicans successfully. Um, I had argued, I was a Republican until 2018. I had argued that Donald Trump shouldn't be, be allowed at the debates. He shouldn't be given, you know, airtime. He's not a Republican. He didn't stand for anything that Republicans once stood for. Um, uh, needless to say, I lost that argument. Um, and, you know, Bernie, um, I lived in Vermont. I was one of Bernie's constituents. But, you know, I think if you're going to, if you're going to challenge Hillary Clinton for the nomination of the Democratic Party, you should actually have to, you know, join the Democratic Party, um, which Bernie just never did. Uh, that tells you something about how parties have just become these kind of flags of convenience for people who want to become president. And I think that that's got to stop. I think that parties, you know, you, it can be done. Back in 1991, George Bush, the first George Bush, said that David Duke, who is running for governor in Louisiana, is not a Republican. 
you know, he can call himself whatever he wants. He's not the party that I lead. He doesn't belong here. And I encourage people to vote against him. It can be done. You can do that. Like we've become so tribal that we, we are just entranced by the R or the D and we can't bring ourselves to say this person is not a Republican or this person is not a Democrat. Um, as for these part unpartied movements, um, I was an advisor to the Lincoln Project and I quit them because I didn't like the way uh, they handled um, the John Weaver scandal. And But I think that the Lincoln Project did and still does important things uh, by reminding people that you can, especially for the Lincoln Project as a, as a group of former Republicans, I think the most important thing they do is they turn to conservative leaning independents and say, it's okay, you're not alone. It's okay to feel this way. You don't have to be a member of a tribe. You don't have to love everything that comes out of the Republican Party. It's, you know, lots of people feel the way you do. Um, and I think that, that, that the Democrats who, again, I think of myself as a member of the coalition with the Democrats as a pro-democracy coalition, but it's okay, Democrats, it's all right to say, you know, um, I, I, I don't think it's okay for Rashida Tlaib to say the things she does. I don't have to agree with AOC about everything. Um, the, we have to loosen that kind of tribalism and restore a sense that if you're going to join a party, it's, it's because you believe in it and not because of what political scientists now call negative partisanship, where, you know, why am I a Republican? Because I hate Democrats. Why am I a Democrat? Because I can never vote for a Republican. It's, it's okay to not be that. Now, for the time being, um, excuse me, <clears throat> I've argued that um, the Republicans, having been captured by an authoritarian movement, have to be voted out right down to the molecular level. Um, but I, I, I look forward to the day when I can start splitting my votes again. I would love to do that. Um, I, I worked for a Democrat in the state house in Boston for two and a half years. And I worked for a Republican in the US Senate, a, a, a moderate Republican, late John Hines, um, for a year. Uh, I mean, the, it used to be that we were normal people who did not live through our party identification. We can do that again. And I think that um, Republicans against Trump and Repub uh, Republican voters against Trump, um, the Democracy Initiative, all these other kind of unparty groups, they, they're, I think they, they serve a good purpose by reminding us that it's okay to feel that way and that we're not alone. We are actually, independents are the largest political movement in America. We're the biggest group of voters there is. We're the majority or the plurality as it turns out, so. Yeah, absolutely. And you've already done a good job sort of spelling out, you know, just how meaningful all elections are and how low those rates of voting really are. And it's just a disaster. <laughs> and it has been for decades. Uh, we have a question very specifically on uh, the Electoral College and nonpartisan uh, redistricting generally. The, you know, th that is a tool if we were to get rid of the Electoral College and have a nonpartisan system for redistricting. Do you think that that would help enable? Do you see my exasperation and my spirit leaving my body? <laughs> Whoever asked the question, look into my eyes. You are not going to eliminate the Electoral College. It is not going to happen. Let that go. The smaller states are never going to agree to a constitutional amendment, which is the only way it could be done. So just get over the fact that the Electoral College exists. I could, I could argue with you and tell you that the Electoral College serves a federalist purpose, that we are a union of states, that you, you don't win a majority of the American public, you win a majority of the people in a majority of the states because we're a federal union. None of that matters. The fact is it's not going anywhere. Now, with all that said, how can you change the Electoral College? Now, that's my, that's my sneaky look. How can you change the Electoral College? Um, one of the things I suggest in the book is enlarge the House. The House hasn't been enlarged since 1913. You're not gonna get rid of the Electoral College but there's no magic reason that it has to be 435 members. You can do that without changing the constitution. And I think it would be great. And I think in their, if they ever return to sanity, most people on the right would agree with you that the house needs to become more representative. I mean, we have 330 million people now. You have house districts that are the size of an entire state. Um, that would immediately change the, the, the fight 
for the Electoral College. Um, you know, make D.C. a state. That's way overdue. Um, stop having these post-colonial hangovers of the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico and Guam. Make, create states out of them. They're states. They're functioning states. Um, they have governors. Um, Republicans will fight you on that, but it's you won't have to fight through a set of constitutional amendments. The, the, the changing the electoral, getting rid of the electoral college is, is a liberal great white whale that is exactly that kind of massive constitutional engineering that is just not gonna happen. And the sooner, the sooner, you know, like angle, anger, denial, bargaining, acceptance, right? You know, just get to acceptance on the electoral college, but then change the electoral college's composition. And then you have a different, a, a different outcome down the line. Great. Love that answer. I love how you inject humor into your very strong opinions. It's such a delight to watch. Um, now, I wonder, the do you... college thing just always kind of sucks <laughs> the life out of me because yes. it's like, you know, what if we were England? Well, yes, but we're not. You know, what if we had a parliamentary system? But, but we don't. And, mm -hmm. and there are structural impediments that will make sure. I mean, look, I live in Rhode Island, um, you know, um, People, we, yeah, we're part of the interstate vote compact. You know what? That'll last right up until somebody wins the popular vote that these states don't like. And then they'll say, oh, null and void. You know, well, we passed another law. We got rid of it. You're going to make long-term sturdy change. This is the other thing that I really have to, uh, there are some things that require emergency action. We are in a constitutional crisis right now. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing you can do is vote and take everyone you can and support, get out the vote. All of these concerns about gerrymandering and suppression, those are meant to affect elections in, in marginal elections. Mm -hmm. They are not meant to withstand large turnouts as Georgia showed you, as other elections around the United States showed you. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the emergency thing is just vote and, and close ranks, stop arguing about the damn infrastructure bill, Stop whining about how Joe Biden isn't Superman. Just, you know, there are two sides in America right now, democracy and authoritarianism. Vote accordingly. But the other stuff that you want to get done, and then I'll get off this soapbox, the other stuff you want to get done takes time. Mm -hmm. You are not going to reform. You are not going to expand the size of the House in time for 2024. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially to deal with the emergency we're in. You're just going to have to accept the rules of the game as they exist right now, whether you like them or not, whether you think they're fair or not. Those are the rules you're going to have to play by in 2024. And make no mistake, Trump and the Republicans are studying those rules and, and weaseling people into positions of authority to hack those rules. Um, so pay attention to those local and state elections. After 2024, if we can get by this emergency, let's start reconstructing the house. Let's start fixing parties. Let's change the rules of military service, something else I talked about in the book. But anyway, um, I'll shut up about that. <laughs> Don't shut up about it just yet, because drilling into that just a little bit, uh, what is your take on ranked choice voting? Um, do you feel that that is a good reform or is that another white whale? I don't care. Um, I don't care about ranked choice voting uh, for two reasons. First of all, uh, it, it I'm not, I'm not sure it, you know, produced a miraculous outcome in New York. Um, I think the guy who won probably would have won anyway. Uh, it's complicated, and the more complicated voting is, the harder the harder it is for a lot of people to vote. Um, you know, that's the other thing. Is like, sure, in New York City, ranked choice voting. We're a very educated electorate, and who care about this? Um, you know, maybe that's a great way to do things. I I don't know. None of this matters if turnout stays so abysmal. And I can't just, I mean, I want to just keep pounding the, you know, the lectern here. Um, you know, if, if you want to solve a lot of problems with this attempted authoritarian takeover in America, increase the youth vote by 10%. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it. It's done. It's over. We just can't do it. Um, you know, in, uh, in uh, 2022, 2020, which really is, we are now in a series of elections. In the book, I talk about, you know, stop catastrophizing elections. Every election is the last election. It's the worst time, blah, blah, blah. But these, that 2020 and 2024 are, are turning point elections. Mm -hmm. And 
we congratulated ourselves for getting to 66% turnout and a youth turnout of about 50%. I'm sorry, that's embarrassing. That's abysmal. Right. Um, you know, if you can move that up 10% in the youth vote, another 10% in the overall vote, it won't, you're, it's done. I mean, the, the, you know, the people that are pushing for an authoritarian solution in America are a minority. They will get outvoted. The reason they're hanging in there is because they vote. They vote at, I'm a former Republican. I'm telling you, Republicans will vote for dog catcher. Yeah. They, they have been carefully voting and, and stacking, I shouldn't even say stacking, they've been doing it legally. They have been electing people to city and state and county elections for years while other people just stay home because it's just boring. Kids, especially, um, you know, the, the, the youth vote, who are the people who don't have problems getting to the polls, who are, you know, pretty well educated about this. They just don't, they, if they're not voting for president, they're not interested. And even then voting for president has to be cool. It has to be, you know, when I, when I was arguing with people on the left during the 2020 election, they said, well, you know, Biden just doesn't excite me. And I'm like, well, how does, how does the end of democracy and an authoritarian takeover excite you? How's that, how's that work for you? Um, you know, well, you know, but I need to be thrilled. I need to be moved. I need to be motivated. That is a disastrous, when you have a very dedicated cult on one side and a group of people who feel that they need to be thrilled and motivated on the other, that, that's how democracies collapse. That's how they end. Yeah, Jeremy um, echoed your thoughts when he said that the youth vote for all or nothing, you know, yes, and right. another question in the chat is how do you connect to and activate the youth vote if many of them feel that the system doesn't represent their interest, <laughs> you know, like again, I, yeah, how do you, how do you, how do you deal with that? Um, well, I think, you know, this is where, you know, before when we were in the green room here and I said, you know, that sometimes people get mad at me because they think I'm the internet's dad. Um, I, I think it's, um, I think the, the, the quickest answer to that is to say, stop whining about your interests. Decide that you are on the side of democracy and progress and, and uh, liberal tolerance and values, or you're not, because that's the choice you're facing now. And when, when people say, well, it doesn't, they don't, you know, these parties don't represent my values. Really? Do you think you're going to do better that, that the things you care about, um, you know, LGBTQ rights, um, climate change, are what, are those going to do better if you stay home and Donald Trump wins the election? This notion that elections have to be tailored to me, to my taste, is killing us. And in the book, let me give you an example from the book to show you why I get so exercised about this, because it's such an amazing couple of examples. Um, the, a reporter is talking to a woman in the Iowa caucuses. Now, caucuses are the caucus goers are the most engaged people. Okay, like that's not just somebody walking up to a primary and casting a vote. Caucus goers, they sign up for it. They they talk with other voters. You you expect these people to be, you know, the most engaged voters. And this young woman in the Iowa Democratic primary caucus says, "Yeah, you know, I really like Pete Buttigieg." And you know, healthcare and you know, Mayor Pete and what he did in Indiana. And then, and it's in the book. You can look it up. But you know, if he doesn't get the nomination, I guess I'll vote for Donald Trump again. I'm sorry, that is that is a completely emotion-driven, celebrity-based approach to voting. That's the same mentality that says, I'm gonna vote for Bernie Sanders to shake things up. And if I don't get Bernie Sanders, I'm going to vote for Donald Trump, which about 12% of Democratic primary voters did. Now, if you can go from Bernie Sanders to Donald Trump simply because you think the, the, the government isn't, you know, re representing your interests enough, then you are not a serious voter and you are not a serious participant in a democracy. Um, there's another case in the book, and I love this because it was the guys in it seem so nice. Um, two brothers in Pennsylvania, and this reporter was talking to him, and said, one of them said, now, don't get me wrong, you know, they're, one, they're like, they work in Scranton, a couple of blue collar guys in Scranton. One says, you don't get me wrong, you know, I don't like Donald Trump, but the Democratic Party has just gone too far to the left for me. 
too far to the left. I can't vote for him. That's why I can't vote for Joe Biden. Now, if Pete Buttigieg or Bernie Sanders had gotten in, I could have voted for them, but not Biden. They've gone too far to the left. You know, at that point, you, you throw up your hands and say, I'm sorry, you could have voted for Bernie Sanders or Pete Buttigieg, but Joe Biden is too far to the left for you. This is this is somebody saying, I want someone to come through the TV and say, Jill, here's what I'm going to do for you personally. Um, and here's the money I'm going to put in your checking account. And by the way, your hair looks fabulous today. That's that's basically what people now want from elected officials or they're going to vote for somebody else. Um, as part of this argument, this was Tim Alberta, um, who wrote a great book on the Republican primaries called American Carnage. Um, Alberta is standing on a porch with all these folks, and, and one woman's yelling, so I can't vote for Biden, he's senile. What about that rapper, Canyon West? She literally says, what about the rapper, Canyon West? And her, of course, there was a teenager who said, uh, it's Kanye West, and he's not on the ballot. And she's like, well, whatever. Sorry, this is not serious voting. This is this is how democracy dies. It it dies in uh, ignorance and giggling and in, and goofball kind of why I can't vote for anybody explanations. So when young people say, "Well, this doesn't represent my interests," my first answer is, "Your interests are still twenty five years down the line, and primarily the the interest you should be thinking about is whether you're going to live in a free country or not." Um, but again, I I have to tell you, and I'll I'll then move on to the next question. I get I have like five or six files of the things that have generated the most hate mail I've ever gotten. So I get a lot of hate mail, and uh, mostly from the right because I'm a, I'm a never Trumper and I attack Trump regularly. So I get a lot of weird you know people challenging me to fights in Alabama kind of stuff. Um, but the, one of the biggest files of hate mail I ever got was when I argued that Joe Biden should not forgive student loans. Because I said this was a bad idea politically. Um, it's never going to fly. It will cause class warfare. It's going to, you know, and of course, millions of young people say, well, this is why I don't vote, right? This is why I don't vote. And I want my student loans forgiven. I'm like, if you, the only reason you vote is because you think Joe Biden is going to give you $50,000 back on your student loans, you really know better than a Trumper. You're not, you're not much better than the people you hate. You're just saying, look, what's in it for me? And if I don't get this thing out of it, I mean, people, people sent me like violent hate mail because I thought they're, you know, that student loans, and I, and mostly there was a piece I wrote back in USA Today. I said, even if you think it's a socially just, it's bad politics. I don't think it's just. I think, you know, people, I, I don't think, I had a lot of student loans. I'm, I understand the pain. I didn't pay mine off till my 40s. Um, but what I was more worried about is this is bad politics and it will cost Democrats winnable elections. And people just didn't want to hear it. They said, I don't care. I want my student loans forgiven. Well, you, you can't sustain a democracy on forgive my student loans and screw everybody else. You, you just can't. Well, I thought you were going to say that one of your biggest hate mail incidents is the Indian food. Uh oh, that was big. <laughs> that was big. I, did, I didn't get a lot of hate mail, but um, when I said that I hated Indian food, um, I had people literally telling me that I was enabling genocide um, and that I should die. Um, <laughs> that, that was fun. Although I will, for those of you that haven't seen this, Preet Barrera took me out to dinner in New York and we turned that into a fundraising event. And I ate like 19 courses of Indian food and we raised over $130,000 for COVID relief in India. So right. shows you that even dumb comments can produce good, good outcomes. Yep, absolutely. And that was really a joy to watch that transition, you know, in your own development of taste for Indian food. It was great. And I still am not, if we go out for dinner, I'm still not, you know, that's not the top of my list, but at least now if, if, if I lose the vote about where to go, I know what to order so that I can get through the evening and like it. So, yeah. Or maybe biryani. I'm a big lamb biryani fan. Oh, great. Get together with Preet again, and maybe you'll get another, uh, another look. No, uh, let's see. Social media. You have some strong feelings in a very active Twitter timeline, but do you feel that 
the way Americans are, are getting their, their media, that, you know, the world that they live in, their echo chamber is making them more self-interested, more yes. self-interested, yes. more narcissistic. How do you stop that? How do you? I don't you know. know. And I, you know, know, as I say in the book, I'm part of the problem, right? I mean, look at me. I have a half million Twitter followers and, oh, everybody liked my stuff. And I got a lot of little hearts and smiley faces and thumbs up. Um, I think part of it is you have to, um, detach yourself from that. Even I do. I, you know, I tell people, um, you know, when it comes to the internet and the synergy between the internet and cable news, which I think has become very dangerous, um, uh, it's okay to unplug for a while. I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a contributing writer at the Atlantic. And for years I was a columnist at USA Today. I tell people, look, I'm paid to have opinions about stuff. And even I don't spend as much time doing this as, as you do, you know, even I don't spend four hours staring at cable news from, you know, 7 PM to 11 PM. I just don't. I mean, I watch a lot of news. My, my wife every now and then is like, you know, we're watching hell's kitchen. I'm turning this off. You know, we got to get away from this, but I, I, I try to tell people I'm actually paid to do this and I don't, and I'm not as plugged in as you all are. It's okay to not have instant opinions about everything. Because the problem is the only way to get attention, and I talk about the attention economy, this, this idea that's been pioneered by, by others who I think are quite right about it, that the only way to get attention is to be negative. So the instantaneous thing is to go out there and say, oh, well, this just happened and I hate it. Because, you know, to say, oh, I, I enjoyed that. That was nice. You know, if I'd have said, hey, I really like Indian food, that would have been forgotten. I went for the gold. They said, oh, I hate Indian food, you know, but um, it rewards that kind of behavior and you have to wean yourself off of it. Um, I think part of this is to stop looking at social media as anything other than an adjunct to your life, as a place where you have discussions, find entertainment. Part of the reason I like Twitter is just fun. I have spent entire arguments, uh, excuse me, evenings arguing about who the best James Bond was. Um, I am I am one of the small legion of Timothy Dalton fans, for example, um, and I like Pierce Brosnan. But you can go for hours about, and it's fun. It's it's frothy. It's light. It doesn't have to be the end of the world. Um, but it's but decide that you're not going to get your information that way. Decide that you're not going to that Facebook in particular is not going to be your primary source of news. Um, it's that easy, you know? Now, I don't know how to deprogram people who just won't let it go. I literally had friends, I, have, I lost a friend who has become completely unreasonably said, well, I don't buy a Facebook, you know, I'm on Facebook and the only other place I get my news is uh, OAN because Fox is now too liberal. Mm. And I think what people need to understand about television and social media alike is that once you're addicted to it, you need bigger and bigger hits of that meth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it, becomes, it becomes like an addiction. Mm -hmm. And if you watch Fox from, eight, from seven to 11, even, mm -hmm. so, you know, and I'm, I'm, I don't do Fox anymore. I'm, you know, I, you can see me on MSNBC and CNN and other places, mm -hmm. but everybody falls into it. You know, like I, there was once a time where I wasn't, or there was a, I won't say what network it was. There was a producer about five or six years ago um, said, you know, basically said, you're not mad enough for us to book you for this story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, well, I'm just not mad about it. I'm sorry. Um, you know, um, I, but I think, um, you know, particularly the right wing environment now is mm -hmm. anger is engagement and keeping people angry is keeping them engaged, keeps their eyeballs on the screen and it keeps them going to the polls. And, and the only, this is what I said at the end of the presentation about self-discipline. Mm -hmm. At some point, you have to just say, I know that, you know, um, I know that there's a bar down the street. I know that there's a Burger King right next to it, but I'm not going to have cheeseburgers and a boiler maker for breakfast. I'm just not. Mm -hmm. It would be fun and eventually it'll kill me, but I'm just not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't have a, actually once, once again, I'll get off this soapbox. I <laughs> once had a um, whimsical, I was asked by Politico, what do you think would solve this? And I said, if I were the king of the world, mm -hmm. I would go back to metering high-speed internet so that you had to pay for it by the hour. Wow. 
because then people would make very different decisions about sitting around on YouTube, jumping down rabbit holes all day. If there was this little meter clicking in the coin, they'd say, is it really, do I really care enough about this to spend another five bucks? Right. You know, uh, because this is, this is like an all you can eat buffet of crap. Um, it's an all you can eat buffet of just terrible, you know, fat and sugar laden food. And why do you eat it? Because it's there. Mm -hmm. And because you don't have the discipline to walk away. from. Right. And it feels good. In the and moment. it feels good. Right. It's comfort food. It's comfort food that tells you, you know, you're part of a tribe. You're part here, I'll, I will, I've been picking on right-wing media, so I will pick on left-wing media just to make everybody really mad for a minute. But mm -hmm. if you watch Fox from 7 to 11, you're one of us. You're mm -hmm. part of the tribe. You know the secrets. You know, the enemy is out there. Only Tucker and Sean and Laura know, and we're going to protect you. And for older people who is Fox's audience, it's very warm and enveloping, and it's a cocoon. Mm -hmm. The equivalent to that, even though I think she's very intelligent and I enjoy her show, Rachel Maddow does the same thing. She takes 20 minutes of a windup to say, I'm going to reveal something secret and important. I'm going to connect the dots for you. You're part of the club. You're part of the insider knowledge that only I can explain to you. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's, it, it creates a personal relationship with presenters that I think is unhealthy. Mm. Because then it's like, well, if I hear it from Rachel, I believe it. But if I hear it from Chris Hayes, well, that's just Chris Hayes. Um, I, I worry about that. And I'm not saying, please don't send me your hate mail. I don't think Tucker Carlson and Rachel Maddow are the same. Tucker Carlson is evil. Mm -hmm. Rachel Maddow is just doing a thing that creates a, a brand loyalty, but it's still not good for you. Tucker Carlson is the worst junk food there is. Mm -hmm. Rachel Maddow is a, a lean cheeseburger and you know healthy fries but it's still not the best way to get your news because then it, it pulls you in and creates a kind of individual loyalty that says only you and i really understand this mm -hmm. and that's bad P read a newspaper i know we're running out of time my yep. advice to everybody is read a newspaper even if it's online pick one national newspaper spend 30 to 40 minutes reading it you will be better informed than 90 percent of the world that is my heartfelt plea. And, mm. and then use um, cable TV sparingly as entertainment or thought provoking or whatever it is, but that shouldn't be your primary form of news. That's great. It's like a media diet, you know, use it wisely. Well, Tom, yes. before we get underway, I just want to say, you know, that I so appreciate what an advocate you are for Harvard Extension School and all the work that you've done here at Harvard and connecting our community. And this book is so intimately tied back to Harvard, um, just like your previous book. So as always, um, I wanna give you the opportunity to give your former students and current students a shout out because they are no doubt um, here today. And yes. tell us a little bit about it. Well, I have to tell you all that, uh, yes, I'm retiring from the War College uh, over the winter, but really for the past 15 years, when I think of my career, I think of what I'm doing at Harvard Extension. Um, you know, during the day, I'm a government servant, and I work. I'm a loyal, uh, a loyal and faithful servant of Uncle Sam. But the um, the courses that I teach year round at Harvard Extension really have been what I feel like has been my career and where my heart lies. So um, you know, it's it, it's a wonderful experience uh, to to teach an extension, and um, the the really it's been. I plan on doing that for a long time to come, God willing. So wonderful. Uh, well, that, that's thank so good you all very much. <laughs> Great. Well, Tom, you know, we hope to see you in person one day soon, but we will follow you on social media and follow you, of course, as you're promoting this book, because it is a fantastic read. So honestly, I, I would encourage all of you to pick this up. Uh, bookmark the heck out of it and take notes and look for other resources or take Tom's classes. There's and so I won't even learn. test you on the book. No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> or try to find the error, right? Yeah. Well, the error, that contest is over. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of errors in the book, but the big one is that I got the director of Three Days of the Condor wrong, one of my favorite movies. And I flubbed, I confused him with Sidney Lumet, who directed one of my other favorite movies. And I, um, I, the minute I saw it, I felt this flush of shame 
And uh, Oxford said, let's turn it into a let's turn it into a contest and see just how dedicated your readers are. And so we actually gave out T-shirts to people who found the um, the error. So, oh. but yeah, I hated that. So um, great. That's such a human story. I mean, things <laughs> happen. What are you on the do? books? There's this, this, you know, this was produced during the pandemic and we had to kind of get it, do it long distance and copy right. editing. There's all a bunch of typos in here. So, you know, this is why if you take my class, I will be gentle on you about typos because I know <laughs> what they feel like. Oh, they're going to take that to the bank, Tom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just great. I can imagine what a labor of love this was, but it was written with such urgency and a thread of humor, which I really, really appreciate. So a great read, no matter what side of the aisle you're on or where you see the country going in the future or the world. So Tom, keep it up and come back again. And, you know, we really do want to see you in person whenever we are safely able. Um, Absolutely. Can't wait. All right. Well, thank Thanks you for having for me for being our inaugural special guest in this series and everyone out there stay well and come back again. Thank you, thank you. Bye Tom. Bye bye.